Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Amul Zaneen, and I'll be your moderator for this segment called Toxic Surroundings. Um, our first panelist is Sister Leila Naji. She is a she has a master's degree in psychology with an emphasis on marriage and family therapy. She is also a mental health educator and conducts many workshops um, on mental health and life skills topics. Uh, Sister Leila also has her own counseling and life coaching business and has been working with her clients for over seven years. Um, she's also certified positive discipline parent educator. Um, so welcome, Sister Leila. And um, our second panelist is Sayed Hussein Makke, who is a student of Islamic sciences. His uh, academic pursuits include a degree in journalism and in religious and global politics. Uh, Sayed Hussein left England at the age of 21 to engage in classical uh, to engage in the classical study of Islam at the seminary in Lebanon, where he currently continues to reside. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, Sister Leila, I will start with you. Um, negative self-talk is this inner dialogue that we have with ourselves, which may limit our ability to believe in ourselves, um, which can be toxic and affect those around us. Um, so the question posed is, how can we overcome negative self-talk? Thank you, Sister Benin, and salamu alaikum, everybody. It's wonderful to be part of this amazing initiative and to talk about such essential topics that affect all of our lives. So with regards to negative self-talk, as you mentioned, it is this inner voice which is constantly critical of ourselves and it's constantly reminding us of our limitations, uh, telling us we can't do things, telling us we will not succeed, and it can actually be very painful. It's not any different to when another person is criticizing you. So it's very important to create an awareness of that voice in order to be able to fight back against it. One of the first things that you can do is to actually create a separation between yourself and uh -huh. that inner voice. So let yourself believe that this isn't really you. None of us are born with this inner voice. Actually, it's learned through the criticism of people around us, sometimes our family of origin, and sometimes through the expectations of society and the community around us, which may make us feel inadequate or that we're failing. And so we pick up on the things that we hear, and that's why it's extremely important the way we talk to others around us the way we speak to children, because they will internalize the things that they hear and start to see themselves through that lens. So once we have identified this negative voice, one of the first things that we can do to separate ourselves from it is to actually give it another name, something silly, something absurd, something that has negative connotations. And that helps us to disassociate from that voice and separate it from ourselves. The next thing that you can do is to actually develop an awareness by possibly keeping a journal or making notes when you find yourself being critical of yourself. So when you catch yourself telling yourself that I'm going to fail at this or I don't have the adequate skills for this or that, make a note of that because when we have an awareness of these negative words and this constant stream of criticism, that is what gives us the tools to actually stand up and fight back against it. We are actually standing up for ourselves against that inner voice. Sometimes we might think that this is spurring us on, that this is somehow motivational. If we criticize ourselves, that it will somehow make us improve. But if you really think about it, people don't really thrive from being punished or criticized. We tend to thrive through encouragement and support and being lifted up and having our skills celebrated and acknowledged. So starting that process of writing down and developing an awareness of these negative words, this crit constant criticism is the first step. Separating ourselves from that voice by attaching a different name to it will help us to externalize it from the inner dialogue to almost as if it's another person. 
And remember that often the phrases that you use, the sentences and the harsh criticism you give yourself, you would never say that to another person. You would never say that to a loved one that you care about. And you shouldn't say it to yourself. We always say, if you can't say anything nice, don't say anything at all. And that applies to yourself as much as it does to other people. And it's important to remember that this is something that's been learned over a lifetime. And we may have been used to this way of talking to ourselves over many years from childhood. And so it's important to be patient and know that we can retrain our brains. We can reauthor our story. At the end of the day, we are the author of our story and we can choose how to write it and we can choose how to speak to ourselves. And when we set that expectation up, Although it will take time and it will take consistency, over time we'll be able to retrain ourselves and eliminate that negative voice, replace it with a positive, encouraging and thriving one and do the same thing that we do for other people for ourselves. Thank you, Sister Leila. Um, Sayed Hussain, outside of this inner dialogue that we have, there is this thing called spiritual abuse, which is uh, not limited to any religion or uh, denomination. Uh, this can include uh, psychological and emotional abuse and can become toxic and very dangerous when it comes from individuals who present themselves as being religious, God conscious, maybe pious. Um, so how can we combat spiritual abuse and its impact in our communities? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you very much for having me on the program. Um, I have a small, maybe big, bad habit of taking too long with answering my questions. So I've given Benin free permission to stop me when I end up ranting too far. But I'll try to get straight to the point. Uh, so when it comes to spiritual abuse, this uh, answer comes in several different uh, fragments. And so I'm not going to be able to talk about each of them. But what I will speak about is when the result of this spiritual abuse can affect your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directly. And one of the ways in which this happens, it happens through several different people who seem pious and religious. But for the sake of the program right now, we're talking about people who perhaps are close to us, who we see as representations of this religion. So not necessarily just uh, people who preach about the religion, but people maybe within our families, who from the way that they look, they represent their religion. However, the way that they act, we know that that's not really the way that the religion is supposed to be represented. The direct impact that it has on us is our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins to have a barrier. We begin to look at Allah in a different type of way. And I've spoken about this before. When you're a child, you are at that point in time looking at your parents as those people who are basically, when you're a kid, they are your lords when you're still a child. You cannot fathom Allah yet. However, you believe in Allah, in your fitrah. You believe in his attributes. But in those attributes, you see them in your parents when you're a young child. So you see your mother, she is the one who is merciful to you. She is the one who is kind. She is the one who loves you. Al-Wadud, Al-Rahman, Al-Rahim. And your father is Al-Qawi, Al-Jabbar. He is the one who is strong, the provider, Razak. You see these different aspects in your parents, first of all. So what would happen if the parents at that time, maybe through no bad intention of their own, or even with a bad intention, say things like, Allah which means God's going to strangle you if you do this, let alone when it comes to their own actions. So here we see that they are now using religion in a way, and this can be parents, it can be anyone else that you know, I'm using that as an example. As an example. And they're using the religion in this time if they want to get a message across to you. However, through doing that, they're now putting a barrier between you and Allah. The result, the impending result is as you are growing up and as you mature and become an adult, you start to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the same light. So if you've been let down by these people around you, you start to look at Allah as the one who's going to let you down as well. You don't even know it yet. And then that's why you start having difficulties even speaking to him or bringing the outside of you. So what we need to do is to re refresh our experience. And remember, first of all, the first thing that we can do to answer your question now, after I've given the, the basis, is look into yourself at that time. 
you have seen now religion as one which is misrepresented. But when you look into yourself, as in how merciful are you towards an orphan? How forgiving are you towards someone who has hurt you? Do you hold grudges or not? When you look into yourself and you realize your own generosity and you realize your own mercy, and if you don't have that generosity and that mercy, then you need to grow that in yourself. When you start realizing that generosity and that mercy or whatever other attribute within yourself, and then you ask yourself the question, am I more merciful than God? Am I more forgiving than God? And of course, you're not. You're not even a fraction of a percentage when it comes to that attribute of God. You start to refresh the way in which you're looking at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And hopefully this is a step taken in undoing the damage of that spiritual abuse. So this is an answer I'm giving from that perspective. I know that there can, they can um, be answers from several different perspectives, but unfortunately we don't have the time. Thank you, Sayyid. That was really um, insightful. So, um, Sister Layla, um, in order to refresh ourselves and to sort of be a little bit kinder and more appreciative, how can we deal with past traumas to appreciate what we have? So trauma is something that when we use that word, it sounds like a very big word. And we often associate the word trauma with things like physical abuse or living through a war or something like that. But there are actually many different types of traumas we can experience in life. Anything from parental neglect to being subjected to emotional abuse, which will lead to that negative self-talk that we talked about earlier. Traumatic experiences can be being diagnosed with a chronic illness, for example, or losing a loved one. So there are, it's a very wide range of things that fall under the umbrella of trauma. Now, how do we heal from it? One of the most important things in healing from trauma is actually acknowledging that experience and being very open and honest about the fact that you went through that. Traditionally, with trauma, in order to protect ourselves, we go into repressing these experiences because it's painful to think about them. It's painful to recall those experiences and those feelings. And it's very much like a post-traumatic stress response where different triggers can set you off unexpectedly. And it can become quite debilitating if you are frequently being triggered and unable to function in the way that you need to in your day-to-day -day life. Now, trauma is something that's very serious. And while it is beneficial to open up to friends and family and talk about these things, my biggest recommendation would actually to be find a therapist or somebody that is trained in the healing of trauma, because they will really be able to allow you to see how your previous experiences currently affect your life and your relationships and the way that you handle different situations and the perspective that you have on the world. Trauma actually doesn't only affect us psychologically, but it also affects us physically. Studies and research shows that a lot of autoimmune conditions and other physical illnesses often go hand in hand with childhood experiences of trauma. And what happens is we get stuck in this state of hypervigilance because we don't feel safe and we're no longer able to distinguish what is a safe situation, what is a safe relationship and what isn't. So we're constantly in this state of anxiety and in this sort of fight or flight syndrome. And that is a very, very exhausting way to live our lives because we're always on the uh, sort of having our guard up. We're always hyper vigilant. We're always looking for the next thing that's going to hurt us or the next painful experience because that once you've experienced that, your brain sort of gets rewired to just see the world through that lens. So I would recommend working with a therapist who will help you to revisit those experiences and actually name the feelings, name the experience, because we're often taught to push these uncomfortable feelings down and we cannot heal from them unless we actually experience them, acknowledge them, give ourselves permission to feel the anger, to feel the sadness, to feel the pain. And it's only through feeling those things that we can work through them and move on. Now, working with a trained professional, they will be able to provide you with the tools 
to calm yourself down, to relax your body, to relax your nervous system when you feel triggered by these different things. And as I said, this could be a person that reminds you of a previous person in your life. It could be a setting that you go to that triggers a past experience. The most important thing also is to be very compassionate with yourself and to be kind with yourself and to realize that this is a process of healing through which you should not carry any guilt and to know that the number of years that this has affected you, it will take a number of years of healing and being on this healing journey in order to regain a sense of calm, a sense of safety and security in your own life in order to be able to distinguish who are the safe people, what are the safe situations and regain that sense of control because trauma can often make us feel that things are out of control because they are not under uh, are they're not under our own choices they're not through under our doing they are things that happen that are beyond our control and make us feel powerless so working through with a trained professional you will learn how to name those experiences to name those feelings and recognize them to identify your triggers and to learn the skills and the tools to be able to de-escalate those feelings when they are triggered in order for them to no longer interfere with your day-to-day -day life and it, as i said it will take time it does require patience but you have to be compassionate and know that you deserve this time and this process to heal in order to be able to live your life to the fullest potential that you are able to do. Thank you, Sister Layla. Um, that was so uh, enlightening to know that, um, you know, we should take care of ourselves as well. Um, it, it's, it's hard to be open and honest and um, not repress, you know, sometimes when we live around toxicity. Um, so Sayyid Hussain, is there any way that we can distance ourselves from toxic family relations? Um, you, you know, staying with family sometimes is the hardest part um, and it, it can get toxic. So is there any way we can distance ourselves from these sort of relations? Sure. Um, I think, first of all, when we are speaking from the perspective of Islam, then we have to remember that when it comes to Silat al Rahm and family, this is a very important aspect of one's life journey and spiritual journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, especially when those family members are our parents, which overrides so much else in our lives when it comes to Islam. Uh, parents are a very sacred station. Now, when we say toxic, uh, we have to define that, I think. We have to define what we mean by those those uh, terms when we say toxic relationships but obviously there's a negative connotation so i'm going to go by that and if we're going to say there's negative experience with these family members um, especially if they're parents or people that we live with then we need to reevaluate our goal reevaluate the goal as in what is the point of this relationship in the first place we say ultimately um, from our perspective is that the relationship should be based on a god-centric view so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the center of my relationship between my parents, my friends, my wife, my children, whoever it is. Because we say, Al-Qalb Arshul Rahman. Imam Sadiq salam, he tells us the heart of the believer is the throne, the shrine of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one else enters the shrine of Allah except Allah. Or whoever enters, enters with permission. So if there are people who are supposed to, inshallah, and if we, if we love them, that will make it a lot easier. But if there are people that are making it difficult to love them with our hearts, um, through Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then at the very least by our duty. So I personally would not distance, speak on my behalf, I would not distance myself from my parents or, you know, these family relations in a way in which I don't talk to them anymore. But at the same time, I wouldn't allow myself to be put in a position where I am going to be oppressed or you know, uh, taken for a ride basically by anyone. This counts for you as well. There is a certain level of self-respect. So what you would do is if they're an extended family member, then it's much easier. You give them a phone call every now and then and it's easy. But when it comes to people who are around us and in our lives very often, like our parents, then in this situation, I have to consider what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from me now. At the very minimum, this is what I do. But I should not allow whatever is happening outside of me to happen inside of me. The outer environment is very important. The inner environment is also very important 
So we need to now reevaluate when it comes to inside me. There are several different techniques that you can do to break the pattern. So notice the patterns as they begin to happen. The first pattern you can notice is in your physical conduct. When that toxic uh, relationship begins to uh, start up, whatever action that person is doing, look at your body, look at their body. Find out what you can do to break the patterns of your physical environment first. Then think of in your mind, what are the thoughts that are coming through, the patterns of your thoughts. Here you can begin to break them. Of course, there are several different techniques that someone can in into their lives so they can observe their thoughts and then they can begin to choose them but this is something when it comes to your mindset that you have to begin to train and prime so whatever situation is happening on the outside if it's a duty that person is making it very difficult for you you have to be able to prime yourself to zoom out kind of like a metaphorical astral projection where you look at the person and you think okay this person is going to say things that are going to bring me down I can't speak logic to this person, but I'm bound to them by blood and duty. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to understand things from the way they see it. Okay, this is my father, let's say. He's someone who keeps bullying me, you know, and it's my duty before Allah to serve him and love him and be with him. So what do I do? Do I destroy myself? No. Try astro, metaphorical astro projection. So you can look at what it is that he's actually asking for. So if he is projecting these negative issues onto you and they're making you feel bad you shouldn't get down to that level and take it in that very sensitive and personal way rather you look at this is an old man who's been through a lot in his life he has a lot of pain and trauma and he's looking for attention right now instead of me getting angry and responding to what he's saying and this whole toxic thing going on i think to myself i feel sorry for him i'm gonna pray for him i'm gonna go serve him right now i might give him a little hug and a little kiss in the cheek as well i might break his pattern He's saying things like, you this and you that. And I say, nice shoes, by the way. You'd be completely shocked. What are you talking about, nice shoes? It's a bit random. But when you do that, you broke his pattern. So that's a way in which you begin to influence your outer environment by breaking his pattern, by saying something completely random. When you want to break your own pattern, here it comes to self-mastery. And it can be done. And this is why uh, people, you look at, Certain people that have to perform always in front of others, they are always primed and their mindset is ready for that. No matter what's happening, people have problems. A lot of people have a lot of problems. People who perform that you see on TV all the time, but they won't let that affect them. Athletes are like that as well because they've primed themselves. So if you want to be able to remove yourself from this situation, you don't have to do it physically. You can break that person's patterns. Of course, it depends on who they are in your life, but you can break their patterns and you need to be able to Look at, analyze, and break your own patterns and master that part of yourself. Thank you, Sayyid Hussain. Um, sometimes cultural values can trump those God centric values of religion that you were speaking about. Um, Sister Layla, how can we set respectful boundaries between ourselves and relatives or partners without being guilt tripped or manipulated by these cultural values? So I think the first thing that's very important to remember is that boundaries do not mean rudeness. They do not mean excluding people from your life. It's just setting up guidelines with which to have a more healthy relationship. We have boundaries in many different areas of society that allow us to exist in a more harmonious and functional way. So I think changing our mindset about boundary, it's not putting a wall up between you and another person. It's just limiting perhaps the interactions that are unhealthy or that are hurtful or that you don't feel serve you very well. And it's just establishing certain expectations. We tend to teach others what we will expect from them and what we will accept from them by the boundaries that we set. If I have somebody in my family who is very demanding of me, who wants to take advantage of my time and my ability to help them, and I don't set a boundary there, and I'm not honest and say, I would love to help, I would love to be there for you, but I can only give this amount of time. Boundaries don't mean just saying no and just rejecting people. It's coming to some compromise that makes you feel comfortable and happy with 
what energy, what time you're giving, and also works for the other person. And so when we do that, what we're doing is we're avoiding the anger, the resentment, and the hurt that we might feel towards this person if we feel that we are being taken advantage of. So if we reframe the way we think of boundaries, they're not rudeness, they're not excluding people from our lives and walking away. And I understand this can be extremely difficult in more collectivistic cultures because we are taught from a very young age to be accommodating, to think of others' needs before our own, and to sort of bypass what feels healthy and natural and right for us in order to meet others' needs, especially family members and our elders and things like that. And so I think realizing that it's a process of compromise where you can get a little bit of what you need and you can give the other party a little bit of what they need and expect of you in a healthy way where nobody is excluding, nobody is closing any doors, but you can also pick up on yourself when you feel that this is too much or this isn't appropriate or you're being asked to give more than you want. If you set those boundaries, you can actually preserve the relationship, avoid any resentment or hurt being built up over time, avoid any feelings of anger that will actually stop you from being able to coexist with that person. And you'll be tense and on edge and resentful and have all of these feelings bubbling up inside of you all of the time. So remembering that boundaries are there for our self-protection, they're there to maintain a harmonious relationship with whether it's family members, whether it's in the workplace, you know, often people feel taken advantage of in the workplace, especially now with the pandemic, with people working from home, you know, employers think we should be available to them 24 seven just because we're working from home. So boundaries are really there to keep us all healthy and to maintain healthy relationships. And I think whenever you're feeling guilty, it's okay to feel guilty, it's okay to feel uncomfortable. We have a tendency to want to avoid tension, to want to avoid uncomfortable feelings, and so sometimes we'll just give in and do what is expected of us, and because we want that sort of yucky feeling of discomfort to go away. It's important to remember that sometimes those feelings serve a purpose and we need to sit with those uncomfortable feelings. And we also need to allow time for the other party to get used to our boundaries. And with time, they will get more used to them. And what will happen is you'll reach some kind of compromise where everybody is getting a little bit of what they need without anybody feeling offended or upset or resentful. So remembering that boundaries are there to protect you and that you are deserving of this protection, of this inner peace. You are allowed to empower yourself, to put yourself first sometimes. And knowing that that will actually enhance your relationships with people because you're not always feeling like you have the short end of the stick and that your needs are being neglected all the time. So think of boundaries as a positive thing, as a guideline that maintains respect between different parties and that allows you to give without overextending, without burning out, without feeling resentful. And hopefully that will lead, as time goes on, people will get used to that and you, excuse me, you will feel more comfortable because you're no longer overextending yourself. Thank you, Sister Leila. Um, uh, before bringing this segment to a close, um, uh, thank you both so much for all the strategies and definitions and um, allowing us to understand how to cope in our surroundings when we come across these things. Um, we would just like to let the audience know that Sayed Hussein runs a warrior life coaching program for men. It's angled at meanings of masculinity and it can be uh, his page can be found on Instagram and Facebook at Spiritual Warrior Program. And um, likewise, Sister Layla also has a counseling and coaching business, and she can also be reached via Instagram at Life Coach Layla. Um, thank you both so much for sharing your expertise, and um, inshallah, we hope everybody uh, benefited from this. Wassalam. Inshallah. Thank you. Assalamualaikum.